everybody. It is Gordon Firemark, the podcast lawyer. It is Thursday, the 19th day of August, and this is the podcast lawyer live. And uh, I should put on my glasses so I can see what I'm doing here. And uh, I'm not sure that's any better. Well, I'll leave them on. Anyway, I am here today to talk about uh, a question that I've seen here on Facebook a couple of times. And um, first off, let me invite you to drop a note in the comments. Let me know you're here. Say hello so I can say hi back. And uh, uh, and we can check in. If you have questions, of course, they are welcome as well. So I'll be right back with this discussion. Today's comp topic is when do I call myself a media, a member of the media? When do I consider myself a professional journalist? So we'll be right back after this. So I confess that I did not write down the identity of the person who asked this question a few days ago in uh, one of the podcasting groups on Facebook. I think it was probably Podcast Movement Community. In any event, the question presented was this. When do I call myself a member of the media? At what point is a podcaster a professional journalist? I interview authors and experts about books and science, and I have 50 episodes. My podcast is still a sole proprietorship, however, not incorporated in any way can I still call myself a member of the media? What do you all do? Thanks in advance. Well, I'm going to answer the question first off. You are a member of the media when you decide that you are going to be making media, at least as a, uh, a regular activity. I don't think that um, being a member of the media has any real particularized meaning beyond someone who makes media content. Um, now, there's a distinction, of course, between what we call mainstream media or traditional broadcast media those kind, or news media, those kinds of things, but those are modifiers to the concept of media. If you are creating media content, I say you're a member of the media. It may be you know, a, a, a very big pool of people who, who can consider themselves that way, but um, I think we should think of ourselves that way because it helps define what we're doing and because it... I guess it attaches to certain legal rights that members of the media, actually all members of the public really have, but certain of these legal rights apply to the making and distribution of media. And so we need to be thinking about that. I'm speaking, of course, of the First Amendment here in the United States, the freedom of speech and of the press. Now, when are you a member of the press is another question. It's possible to be a member of the media without being a member of the press. And that is, you know, look, you can be a YouTuber, you can create you know, how-to content, you could do, um, you could teach lessons on, you know, fly fishing or something like that. You're a member of the media, but you're not doing news. You're not doing journalism, press, you know, and so I think that's one of the distinctions. Now, the question, of course, was at what point is a podcaster a professional journalist? And I would say that's a little bit of an eye in the, uh, a little bit in the eye of the beholder, you know, if you are making media and you are doing it in a way that you think of it as journalism, and by journalism, it doesn't have to be hard-hitting. It can be, you know, just informing the public uh, of matters of reasonable public concern, that kind of thing. One of the definitions that I found today when I was looking at this was, a journalist is an individual trained to collect and gather information in the form of text, audio, video, pictures, and so on, and processes them to a newsworthy form and disseminates it to the public. I don't like the term newsworthy in there because worthiness is a qualitative judgment that I think is, uh, doesn't have a place in this discussion. Um, what you think is newsworthy, I may think is fluff and vice versa. So it shouldn't be about whether anybody but you thinks it's newsworthy. If you believe people have a, a, a right and a need to know this information, no matter how few of those people there are out there, I consider that to be a valid reason to be creating media, and you should consider yourself a journalist. But journalism uh, here, you know, talks about the act or process mainly done by this journalist we defined uh, is called journalism. Now, a couple of the comments in the, uh, the comments were all over the place in this particular thread, and I found it really interesting. By the way, let me just stop and invite you to say something in the comments so I know you're here. Uh, a quick hello so I can give you a greeting. And, uh, of course, if you have a question, post it as well. I'd love to answer your legal questions around the podcasting world. But back to the comments in, the, in this original question about uh, media and journalism. Uh, they were all over the map. Um, Carolyn said, I have an undergraduate degree in print journalism. 
I edited three magazines and worked as a freelance journalist for more than a decade. If I were assigned to cover a story and needed credentials, the news media that company that hired me secured those for me. Journalists are required to adhere to a code of ethics, which is why when Fox News reporters testify in court, they are the first to say they are not journalists and that people shouldn't believe what they say because they are entertainers. As a podcaster, though, I hold myself to standards, but I don't consider myself a journalist. Well, that's Carolyn. On the other side, Neil uh, says he became a member of the UK Nation National Union of Journalists, the NUJ, as a direct result of the podcasts he produces, and he's happy to call himself a journalist. But I think James Cridlin, my friend and, and colleague James, hi James, if you're out there listening, uh, says this, you can call yourself what you like. If you want to call yourself a journalist, go ahead. If you want to call yourself a member of the media, go ahead. Whether people think you are is entirely up to them. And that really begs the question of why does it really matter? Before I go there, I just want to touch base on uh, the last bit of the question, which focused on the fact that the podcast is still a sole proprietorship and not incorporated. I don't think that has any bearing on this at all. I think you can call yourself a member of the media and you can call yourself a journalist if that's the way you see yourself. And if you're willing to hold yourself to this, the expectations of what that means for you and for the outside world. So the question is, why does it even matter whether you're a member of the media or whether you're a journalist? Most of the time, it really doesn't. You're doing your thing and you're out getting the message out and, and that's great. I member of the media. When it matters is when you need to get a press credential to attend and cover a particular event or to cover a particular you know, set of stories or something like that. And in those instances, the credentialing authority, that is usually a police department or sometimes the organizers of an event, they will determine what their criteria for granting a, a press credential, press pass, would be. And certain state laws will also have a bearing on that as well, depending on, you know, what state you're in. Now, this is troubling to me in a little bit of a way because, you know, when you're relying on government or government agencies to determine who's a journalist, who's the press, I ask the question is, is that really fair when part of the role of the media as what we call the fourth estate, the first three estates being the legislature, the uh, executive and the judiciary, the fourth estate is the media, the watchdog that is keeping an eye and keeping the public informed about what's going on. If the government gets to decide who is allowed to be a watchdog and who is not, I say that's troublesome and that's something we, we should be keeping a close watch on these days, especially these days. So why does it matter? What's the, what's it, what does it mean for you? Uh, folks out there watching and listening, I'd be very interested to know, what do you consider to be someone who's a member of the media, a member of the press? Is the role of the press to inform the public or is it to pro pro promote a cause or a company? Is it to shed light on meaningful controversies or to win some kind of an advantage? Public interest is more, uh, you know, it, it's not just about whether a person is a, is a journalist, is whether they're a reporter or a writer. There are lots of ways to serve the public interest by making media content that doesn't have to look like hard news, right? But we have to be careful. There's a slippery slope here because if all of our personal communications are viewed as acts of journalism, then everybody could cynically claim, I'm a journalist, in order to get a benefit or, or evade the coverage of some kind of law or keep themselves out of court or from having to reveal their sources, those kinds of things. And then that sort of devalues the real role of a journalist in society as that fourth estate watchdog. And then there's the other problem is whenever we rely on the government to define what's journalism, the legislature, the, the people who make those laws, they have the ability to change that definition at their whim, basically. They could have spite in mind. They could just want to control the definition. Hey, if you don't have X number of readers or this many viewers or you're not employed by a company for you know this many years doing journalism, then we don't consider you a journalist. Uh, in fact, this became an issue, uh, that's now about eight years ago, but in 2013, uh, Congress was considering what's called a federal shield law. A shield law is a law that allows journalists to be insulated from uh, claims of contempt and liability if they refuse to disclose their sources, among other things. Um, under that, back in 2013, that law was being debated. It never, never made it into law. 
but the Congress people were talking about defining a journalist, get this, as someone employed by or in contract with a media outlet, another term that needs definition, for at least a year within the last 20 years or three months within the last five years, or someone with a substantial track record of freelancing in the last five years or a student journalist. Still sort of wishy-washy and so on. They were concerned at the time about making sure that WikiLeaks didn't get to say, hey, we're media, we're press, we're immune, we don't have to reveal our sources. Uh, WikiLeaks, of course, had been uh, the, um, the uh, channel through which um, some um, important, you know, national security kinds of information were released by, I believe it was Edward Snowden, um, Julian Assange, of course, is the founder and operator of WikiLeaks, and um, uh, we wanted to get him in to talk about how this stuff came to be, came to pass, and it became another issue in the 2016 election, and it's continued to be a challenge. So this is a, a question and an issue that's very fraught, but um, for our purposes as podcasters, I think we should think of ourselves certainly as members of the media, and if what we are doing is reporting on matters of public interest to our audiences, we should think of ourselves as journalists. Now, not all journalists are, are doing hard news, as we said, right? Uh, my own show, for example, Entertainment Law Update, is targeted mainly at lawyers and folks who pay attention to entertainment law, but what we do is report on the news. We report on the cases that have been... Um, decided and and that are continuing through the courts as that happens. And so I consider that to be journalism. Uh, we are not, it's not hard hitting journalism and we are, we don't hold ourselves out as being, um, you know, living up to the full standards of journalism and multiple sources and, and, you know, all kinds of um, the journalistic ethics, although we try to be ethical about it, but this is a part of that moving target, I guess you could say. So I consider myself a journalist, and you should feel free to do so. Also, uh, where it will become an issue is if you ever do get called into court and are asked to reveal your sources, you may have a fight on your hands by if you argue that you're a journalist and you shouldn't have to reveal those sources. Some states have these shield laws in place. Other states, they, it varies from place to place. So um, I would say get in touch with a lawyer if that's the kind of thing that you're encountering. This person interviewing uh, people with something interesting to say, I think it's pretty unlikely to encounter challenges about whether or not you're a journalist, but it could happen. If you decide you need to cover an event, um, you know, having 50 episodes of a podcast, more than a year's worth of that in the last 20, that'll go a long way to establishing your, your bona fides as a, a legitimate member of the media, the press, the, uh, the journalistic club in order to get that, um, that uh, what do you call it, that credential. So there you go. Dean is watching from Melbourne, Australia. Nice to see you, Dean. Uh, thank you for being here with me. If you have a question, please post it. Craig is here as well, and he asks, um, does the method or source of dissemination factor in? For instance, aren't most social media outlets considered platforms, not publishers, and aren't publishers afforded protections? That's a great point, Craig. Um, I think that if you post a tweet on Twitter, Twitter is not considered a news outlet. Uh, Facebook probably isn't considered a news outlet, even though it is where many of us get a lot of our news nowadays. Um, I think that the platform, they get to take advantage of a different set of laws that protects platforms. Specifically, I'm referring to something called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which gives those platforms a, a fairly wide berth uh, uh, of, of insulation and, and elimination of liability for the things they publish, uh, especially when it comes from third-party users of their, of their service. But um, it's one of the big challenges is that, you know, Facebook could publish something that the New York Times can't, even though it's the exact same content written by the same journalist. Uh, New York Times could get sued for libel or slander or, or whatever, um, while... Facebook would be immune under Section 230. The question of whether that's right or wrong. That's something to take up with your congressional representatives in, in the time and place. So publisher, platform, I don't know that that is, a, is an important distinction for whether we as individuals should consider ourselves journalists. If you're a Facebook employee, I think it's going to be pretty hard for you to, to go and get a press credential on that basis. 
Uh, whereas if you're an employee of the New York Times or ABC News, yeah, you're you're going to be treated as press that way. But ultimately, what you do, how you do it, and how long you've been doing it, I think, are, are going to be pretty important factors for that. So uh, I hope I answered your question. Um, um, and yeah, hi, Craig. <laughs> nice to see you too. Um, what else did I want to talk about today? Anybody have any questions here? No? Nothing like that? All right. Well, let me um, just uh, look at my list of things here. Oh, I was going to talk about a case. I talked about this in my email newsletter. If you aren't already on my list, uh, come on over to firemark.com and join the list. There's a little form on the page or download my free podcast guest release and that'll put you on the list as well. Go to podcastrelease.com if you like. But um, this is an interesting case. It came down. It's actually nothing to do with podcasting, nothing to do with... Um, entertainment even, but it deals with inter internet law and contracts. And I thought it'd be interesting. It came out of the state of Mississippi. The Supreme Court of Mississippi on August 5th decided this case. Um, Judd, uh, the case is called Parish Transport LLC versus Jordan Carriers Incorporated. Jordan Carriers, um, Doug Jordan was the, it was the fellow there. He offered to sell a bunch of equipment to um, to uh, b -b -b the, the parish transport folks um, for a million four hundred forty-three thousand dollars. After a while, parish responded. Um, they offered to buy it for one and a quarter million dollars. Jordan then replied, saying, "We need to discuss it. We'll get back to you." And then um, that email reply, the "I'll get back to you" reply, included his name and contact information as a sort of a signature. Jordan uh, then discusses it with his party and replies again to the email saying, okay, let's do it. But this time he did it from his mobile phone and the email just had sent from my iPhone rather than his full signature block. And the question then became when, when he later sold the goods to somebody else for a different price and was challenged for breach of contract, was there a contract formed by those emails? And the court took a good hard look at all of this and um, ultimately ended up saying, yeah, they gr they granted the motion for summary judgment. I'm sorry, how did it go? Uh, after the cases were consolidated, there was the summary judgment that it didn't have an enforceable contract, and the court agreed, granted the summary judgment cases out. Parish Transport, the, the plaintiff in the case, appealed, and it goes up to um, the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals said, Merely sending an email doesn't satisfy the signature requirement and, uh, and that an email that states sent from my iPhone doesn't adequately indicate that the sender intended to sign the record. So the Supreme Court of Mississippi takes a look at this and goes the other way. They said, look, the Mississippi Uniform Electronic Transactions Act governs this. And they found that the, that act permits contracts to be formed by an electronic means like email and... Um, they found that the determination of whether an email was electronically signed was a question of fact that turned on the party's intent to adopt or accept the writing. And that was a determination for the fact finder, the jury. Because here there was a genuine issue of material fact about whether or not Jordan, the defendant in the case, had intended to accept the contract terms, the court reversed and sent it back down for a trial where a jury could make a decision about his intent. So the message here is, if you are doing stuff back and forth on email, be careful about how you respond to things. If you intend to be bound by something and you say so, it will be binding, even though there's not a blue ink wet signature on a piece of paper. Contracts can be formed by email. That's the takeaway here. And I think that's pretty important for us to remember as we start getting into, I don't know, doing advertising deals or sometimes even guest release agreements, although I'm, I'm a proponent of getting a formal written guest release because I want the language to be the same every single time um, and make sure you include all of the right provisions. Uh, it can be done electronically as long as there's a clear manifestation of the intent of the parties to be bound. This uh, Mississippi Uniform Electronic Trans Transactions Act is, as far as I can tell, similar to those that are in place in most places in the country and to the federal law that governs this stuff. So be careful what you say yes to and how you say yes in an email. If you intend not to be bound, you, you could say something like, sounds good, let's go to the long forms, all rights reserved. 
or something like that. And then you can expect to see a real contract. But without that, your intention can be inferred from your emails. And that's a dangerous game in the making of contracts. So that's all I have for today. I want to just say thank you for being here and let you know that uh, this show is brought to you, as always, by uh, Legit Podcast Pro, my free Facebook group for podcasters who are serious about taking their podcasting to the next level and uh, and uh, becoming professional about it. And um, I invite you to join by visiting legitpodcastpro.com and then joining the Facebook group as well. Give me your email address so I can reach you in case something happens uh, with, with Facebook or whatever. And um, we're doing some, some training coming up in a few weeks. So come on in and we'll be talking about more of how you go about being a pro in the space of podcasting. And that's going to be it for today. I'll say thanks again for watching. And I'll see you again really, really soon uh, when the Podcast Lawyer Speaks live. Have a great day.